It's weird. All right, well, it started recording, but I'll, I'll give Selena that little bit of extra time to rejoin because she just got booted. Um, so I guess I'll kind of fill in the time now with saying welcome to lesson three. <laughs> Uh, this is where we look at DNA replication. So we're going to kind of talk about the aspects of DNA replication that make DNA code such an important aspect to all life and why it is such a dominant measure in terms of life. And if there are theories and hypotheses around non-DNA life in terms of different structures that might exist as a result of it. Oh, as a result of different types of chemicals that can be utilized or mole molecules that can be utilized. But ultimately, DNA is the best way to pass on that information with regards to any and all life that we know. So looking at the mechanisms of DNA replication, uh, we really have to take into consideration the work done by Mendelssohn and Stahl in 1958. And they had two proposed methods of DNA replication. There is the conservative approach, which looks at the parent's DNA and new strands are completely separate. So the parent and new strands are completely separate. So uh, I'll break down the, the aspects of conservative versus semi-conservative uh, afterwards. And yes, I, mean, I have no idea. When I started the meeting, it said that it has to kick you. Um, and when I started the recording, it said that I had to kick you. No, not sure. I, I'm glad that you're able to rejoin afterwards. Um, but that's never happened before which was weird. I think it has something to do with your settings, to be honest, but we can talk about it later. Anyways. Okay. So when we look at that conservative approach, we're talking about the parent DNA and new strands being completely separate. It's what we call an as is copy. So when we look at the conservative replication component on the right side of that diagram, you start off with the purple strands and that gets copied in its entirety, right? Entirely copied. Those red strands are the entire red strands are the entire copy, and we would expect the purple and the red strands to be separate from each other. So they're completely separate from each other. The semi-conservative approach looks that the original parent strands are blended with new copies. So when we look at the mechanisms of copying DNA, we're really going to talk about how that DNA gets copied and how it is going to be tested in terms of, of how it's copied because Mendelssohn and Stahl had this ingenious way, again, as all genetics experiments go, they had this ingenious way. They're going to use these radioactive isotopes. They're going to use a nitrogen isotope, two nitrogen isotopes, N14, which is light, and N15, which is heavy. And the way that they calculate, again, that has to do with the way that energy is released as a result of their atomic structure. But they're going to look at it and they're going to say, okay, if it's conservative, if it's conservative, right? If it's conservative, we would expect that no, we would expect that no N15 be attached to that new copy, all right? We would expect it to just be one copy of all that N15 and one copy of all the N14. So let's talk about how they manage that. It's basically gonna look at the mass of DNA. So they grew bacteria in a heavy nitrogen medium, so that N15, for many generations until all of their DNA was heavy nitrogen bases only. So when you think about the amino acids that are responsible for the structure of those uh, DNA structures and those um, nucleotides, it only had N15 heavy nitrogen in it. So they then took those bacteria out and they put it in a medium with only N14, that lighter nitrogen isotope. So that each new copy of DNA that these bacteria made would have light nitrogen in it. So they could test, okay, they would say, all right, the original DNA is all N15 DNA, all of it. Any copy that it makes of itself will have to be that N14. So now we can test if it's semi-conservative or conservative. If there are pure strands of N14, we know that it's conservative. The original N15 will eventually only being one out of the four copies after their second generation. And we would say, okay, it's conservative. However, if half of the DNA at some point was light and heavy isotopes of N14 and N15, we could say, okay, it's a semi-conservative approach. So they transferred these bacteria into that N14 medium. They grew that bacteria. The DNA was allowed to replicate. And they found 
that DNA replication must be semi-conservative. Half of the DNA at some points were, uh, were N14 and N15 isotopes. They contain N14 and N15 isotopes. So they saw this band in the middle, right? When they did that, that testing, they saw that band in the middle because it was an average of the two weights. And then the next generation, they saw still some of that average band in the middle, but they also saw some lighter DNA. So the original parent DNA was heavy, all N15. After that first generation, after that first replication cycle, the average weight was somewhere in the middle because it was N14 and N15. And then the second generation after that, it was a layer of light DNA and intermediate D weight DNA. If it was conservative, that first replication process, they would have expected to see heavy and light only, not a mix. So that's how they were able to uh, assess the semi-conservative DNA replication nature. And it was quite ingenious in the 50s. And, and quite frankly, it's uh, a method is still used today when we talk about gel electrophoresis. It's a, a method still used today, you know, 70 plus years or 60 plus years later, still based off of that uh, Mendelssohn and Stahl method in 1958. So now we can start to, now that we recognize that DNA is, is copied semi-conservatively or replicated semi-conservatively, we can start to look at the specific details of how that DNA is replicated. And I'm going to show you a video later on because it's quite fascinating how it works and, and specifically how helicase works. But helicase is an enzyme that is responsible for breaking those hydrogen bonds between those nucleotides. It unwinds and separates the two strands of DNA. And I'll talk about the specifics in terms of how it moves, but helicase spins as fast as a jet turbine engine does. And so the fact that something as small as this enzyme can spin as quickly as a jet turbine that's in some of the most advanced, you know, uh, advanced planes today is quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, baffling, but here we are. So it unwinds by utilizing something called the replication fork. So the spot that helicase is at is called the replication fork. That replication fork is the location where those strands will separate. And it's going to, I'll talk about the direction that it moves because it always moves in five prime to three prime direction. I'll talk about that more as, as we go through this lesson, but it's just, again, the key, comp the key component here is that that helicase is going to separate those two strands by breaking those hydrogen bonds, and it creates a spot called the replication fork. So there are problems with unwinding. There are some problems that come as a result of unwinding. The first problem is that it creates tension. Tension builds up in the wound portion, which could cause some breaks. As that helicase unwinds, right, there's still going to be a portion of it that has and carries a lot of tension. So one solution to that tension that is created is a uh, topomerase or a gyrase enzyme. This makes small cuts in the sugar phosphate backbone to relieve tension. And it's quite ingenious the way that this uh, enzyme evolved. Well, that ingenious implies a design, but it's quite interesting the way that it, it evolved simply because it uh, all DNA that doesn't contain this isn't able to replicate. So it's an interesting little caveat to the ability for DNA to replicate in that it has this enzyme that is responsible for relieving some of that tension. The strands, after they're separated, they tend to want to rejoin, right? They tend to want to anneal, it's called, and form those hydrogen bonds because those hydrogen bonds are quite strong and they can attract, especially once it's broken apart, it will want to reform those hydrogen bonds because of that desire to create that force. So we have what's called an SSB or single-stranded binding proteins, and these block nucleotides from hydrogen bonding. It's basically a little cap that fits onto the uh, unwound nucleotides to allow for the process to continue without the reformation of hydrogen bonds. Because if it reforms, then the helicase has to do more work, which is completely redundant, and we need to replicate it accurately, we need to replicate it quickly, and we need as little error as humanly possible, which I'll, I'll allude to later on. So they do not stay in this unwound state for very long. Quite frankly, as soon as that helicase unwinds it, the process of replication starts pretty much immediately. And it starts pretty much immediately with regards to the idea that 
once these enzymes uh, or once that helicase breaks down those hydrogen bonds, other enzymes basically rush in and are attracted to those uh, nucleotides, those exposed nucleotides, and it will start to add complementary nucleotides quite quickly. And it's going to make those copy strands quite quickly as soon as that helicase starts to open up. These new strands are going to form in small sections that are called complementary, or, or until they finally form a complementary or daughter strands from that original or template strand. And it's quickness and it's the accuracy with which that it can do that. It, it really is good at compartmentalizing it. As soon as that helicase opens things up, those exposed nucleotides are immediately bound to enzymes and proteins that are going to make those uh, complementary strands or those daughter strands from that template. So it's happening in multiple different places at once, as that diagram shows you here. I'll talk more about Okazaki fragments uh, in a bit, but it's happening. If you think about how long DNA is, it needs to be the, it's, it's going to be important to understand that it happens in so many different phases because if it just happened in one spot and they did it slowly moving outward, it would take quite some time. And I'll talk about the anti-parallel nature in step two. So again, the many replication bubbles are going to be at once. It's going to make that process more efficient and fast. Uh, there's a specific direction that DNA building must follow involving the direction of each strand. Recall, what is meant by that 3-5 and to, uh, uh, that three, three prime and, and five prime ends of DNA strands. Well, we're looking at the anti-parallel, right? That anti-parallel aspect, that anti-parallel aspect of DNA. And it's important to recognize that at the three prime end, we have a free hydroxyl group on the C3 of ribose, right? That C3 of ribose, i.e. three prime. And then on the five prime end, we have that free phosphate group on that carbon five or that C5 of ribose. So that's where the three prime and five prime name come from. And it's important to recognize that the strands are always going to build off of the leading strand, right? The leading strand is built as one continuous strand in the direction of the replication fork. Now, what that means is that that continuous leading strand, which moves three prime to five prime, right? That three prime to five prime end, okay? It's going to have, it's called the leading strand because replication happens in a continuous, smooth, linear manner. It doesn't stop, it just keeps going. When we think about the lagging strand, the lagging strand is built in multiple pieces, multiple pieces along the way. And it's away from that replication fork. Eventually, its fragments are gonna be joined together by an enzyme. DNA polymerase, which forms those new strands in a five prime to three prime direction. So the reason why we have to think about that anti-parallel nature of three prime to five prime is because ultimately it allows for DNA replication to happen in a very specific way. But the big thing here is that three prime to five prime anti-parallel structure allows for those hydrogen bonds to fit correctly, so to speak. So as a result of it fitting correctly, three prime to five prime um, and, and anti-parallel in nature, it creates that leading and lagging strand, which can create some interesting issues. But ultimately, the big thing you have to recognize here is that DNA is always going to be in that five prime to three prime direction. So in order for the, us to understand the true anti-parallel nature, if we start up with the three prime for that leading strand up here, its copy here needs to be five prime. And it will go in five prime to three prime direction. And we should be perfectly fine. But the problem with down here in this lagging strand is that we already have that five prime strand. That's the five prime strand, that lagging strand, that five prime cap is free. It needs to go five prime to three prime. So it starts from the left. I'll make a little better mark on it. It starts from there towards that end, right? It has to be five prime to three prime, but it essentially creates chunks. And I'll talk about those chunks of strand now. So, Let's take a look at those details of DNA replication. What do you think DNA polymerase does? Its main goal is going to be that DNA polymer. It's forming a polymer of DNA based off of those nucleotides that it has access to. So DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the three prime end. As I alluded to in that previous statement above, why is it so important 
that it can only add, or why is it so important for us to know why it can only add a nucleotide to the three prime end? Well, to understand that, we have to remember what reaction needs to take place in order for things to be attached. That polymerization reaction we've looked at several units ago, we need to be able to hydrolyze or to, to dehydration, to create that water molecule. And in that creation of the water molecule, which is the removal of that hydroxyl group at the three prime end, we can attach a new nucleotide on there. And it has to utilize that hydroxyl group at the three prime end in order to form that dehydration reaction and ultimately, ultimately make that polymer of DNA. So we cannot, we cannot attach a nucleotide on to the five prime end because we don't have access to the necessary chemical components to create that DNA strand. So let's take a look at the specific steps. In step one, something called an RNA primer, which I'll talk more about later, uh, but recognize that RNA is different structurally from DNA, which you learned in grade 11. An RNA primer is added across from a three prime nucleotide, i.e. primer is built in a five prime to three prime direction. This is important to recognize because RNA primase, which is the enzyme that adds that RNA primer on, it's looking at it, it's being, it's built out of RNA nucleotides, right? The, the key difference between that thymine and that uracil, right? Ribosugar and a, instead of a deoxyribosugar, and it's going to have that uracil, uh, uracil base instead of that thymine. So we have that RNA primer that's attached on, and now we can start to utilize that RNA primer. It's the, in, in the diagrams to the left, it's that blue piece, that blue strip of DNA. We can look at DNA polymerase three, DNA polymerase three will start to add nucleotides from the three prime end of that RNA primer. So it's gonna use that RNA primer to start adding DNA nucleotides or complementary bases based off of that original parent strand. So if it's a C, it's gonna add the G. If it's, gonna, if it's a T, it's gonna add the A and so on and so forth until it continues to copy that strand nucleotide by nucleotide moving in that five prime, three prime direction, but always onto that three prime end, right? So we have now the underpinning start and the two enzymes that are uh, responsible for adding on nucleotides to make that copy of DNA. The third step is that we have to take a look at that lagging strand, right? Because that lagging strand is made out of chunks. Remember, we can only add a new nucleotide onto that three prime end. So we have to do that lagging strand in chunks to continually, continuously allow for that three prime end to be exposed. Because again, when you think about the anti-parallel nature, we really have to start from that helicase spot where it's unzipped. And if it starts there, there's a new unzipped portion that has to be exposed every time DNA is unwound. So we eventually get these strands called Okazaki fragments. And these Okazaki fragments are discontinuous chunks that are DNA and RNA mixed, or RNA primer and DNA chunks or fragments. It's discontinuous because it needs to add new primers every time that helicase opens up and exposes new DNA for it to be copied. And these nucleotides have to continuously be added on and a new fork is created, new primer added, new Okazaki fragment. So this DNA polymerase, again, I, I'm gonna hammer this to absolute death with regards to this. This DNA polymerase only works in the five prime to three prime direction. So step three, we are looking at Okazaki fragments. We recognize the lagging strand is going to be composed of many of those pieces. And it's because DNA polymerase only works in that five prime to three prime direction because it has to attach nucleotides onto the three prime hydroxyl group. And it only attaches it on as that helicase exposes new strands. So now we have polymerase one make an appearance. And it's funny again, right? When you think about how things are named in biology, uh, photosystem one, even though it's not the first thing that does stuff, we found it first, therefore it's photosystem one. Oh, photosystem two, we found it again. Oh, new, new photo. Wait a second. It comes before photosystem one. And uh, let's just keep it the same name. Same thing here happens with the polymerases. We now get to DNA polymerase one. And DNA polymerase one moves along those daughter strand and replaces any of those RNA nucleotide uracils with the correct thymine base. Because RNA nucleotide structure is different from DNA nucleotides, 
and we need to ensure that all of that replicated DNA is all DNA. We cannot have any RNA. So RNA polymerase one makes an appearance at the later stages of DNA replication, even though it was discovered um, first, it was only recognized that it does things at later stages. And with regards to DNA polymerase two, I'll talk a little bit about it later, but yes, there is. So RNA nucleotide structure is different from DNA nucleotide structure. We need to replace all of those RNA molecules or that uracil with the correct DNA, uh, the correct DNA analogous chunk or that thymine. We then get to DNA ligase, which joins together the Okazaki fragments to make a continuous daughter strand. We cannot have any gaps of that five prime, three prime gap. So it's gonna continuously bind all those Okazaki fragments together. And it's going to form a phosphodiester bond to seal those gaps. So it's the DNA ligase is a very important and unique enzyme because it takes that phosphorus group, that phosphate group, and it catalyzes a reaction to seal that bond or to seal that gap between those Okazaki fragments. So it's going to form that phosphodiester, phosphodiester bond. Okay, and then last step is that we're going to continue that until the entire DNA strand has been copied. This set of steps happens at each replication bubble. So if you imagine a strand of DNA, an entire strand of DNA that has uh, 60 different replication bubbles, this is happening at 60 different places along that DNA molecule with like 99.3% accuracy or some ridiculous level of accuracy. So you can really start to appreciate the, the complexity of, of DNA replication and how the biological machine as a whole is able to function so wonderfully or so beautifully in the context of every little thing that has to go on and all the different enzymes and all the different proteins that have to work together. So the reason it's so successful is because it is very good at checking its errors. DNA replication errors do not happen as often as they potentially could. And it's because it's that consistent checking that allows for DNA to have that good fidelity that we see in life. So it's looking at checking and dealing with any errors. So that enzyme complex, as it's going, that polymerase through, as it continues nucleotides in that forward direction, as long as the, the most recently added nucleotide is correctly paired, it's gonna continue that process. However, if DNA polymerase three adds a mispaired nucleotide by accident, for whatever reason, the enzyme complex will reverse. And that DNA polymerase three acts as a deoxyribonuclease and it removes that mispaired nucleotide. So not only does polymerase three add those nucleotides on during synthesis, it also checks, it also removes, and it also re-adds the correct nucleotide. So DNA polymerase three is this wonder enzyme that essentially can figure things out on the fly. As it's, as it's adding those nucleotide pair bases one by one at, mind you, mind-breakingly fast speeds, it's also double checking its work and fixing its mistakes at the same time. And once it fixes that mistake, the enzyme complex will continue its, its uh, activity along that DNA strand, and it will continue to add those nucleotides, again, in that five prime to three prime direction. So DNA polymerase three is, like I said, it's like 99.3% accurate. I think I'm exaggerating here, but it's insanely good at its job. If for whatever reason it misses an error, which it does, the after replication components come in. So we start to look at the error being fixed or excised at the, the chunk of DNA that has that mistake. We're going to look at repair complexes that recognize a mispaired uh, nucleotide sequence. It's going to essentially remove the several nucleotide sequences around that area where the error, occur error occurred. The DNA gap will be filled in by DNA polymerase using that intact template strand as a guide. And then the NIC that was added in as a result of uh, the excisation will be sealed by DNA ligase and the repair will be finished. So there's two methods with which DNA synthesis is checked and fixed, the during DNA synthesis and after DNA synthesis. So as I alluded to here, it's a super good proofreader 
If it inputs that wrong nucleotide and that complementary nitrogen is bare, it will stop and replace it before moving forward. It's super good at detecting incorrect size and shape. It's, it's very, very, very good. Yeah, DNA synthesis is the making of that, rep yeah, that replicated strand. Uh, yeah, so one in every one million bases. So like 99 point whatever percent chance it's going to stop that from happening, that mistake from happening. Again, right on the off chance that that polymerase 3 does make that mistake, or there is another error in DNA after some other aspect or some other cycle, we have that repair complex enzyme that comes in, identifies the damage, and repairs it. This repair enzyme will remove the section where the error occurs, and it will rebuild that section strands using that complement or that uh, leading strand, so that way they are complementary to each other. The key thing, or the cool thing about this, is that when you think about apoptosis or programmed cell death, it's going to use this concept as a last resort. So if the mutation can't be fixed, or the cell can't be fixed, uh, the DNA can't be fixed, what have you, uh, apoptosis will be utilized to fix that error. Meaning it will just look at that cell, different pathways get triggered and the cell effectively will be, uh, will be destroyed to prevent that mutation DNA from being spread. Okay, folks, uh, that's it for this first lesson of our three lesson day. Uh, it is a lot to take in, so I wanna give you this period to kind of look it over and ask questions. Uh, so we'll stop recording here and you can ask your questions.